Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone who's joining us this day as it's a historic day uh, for WPL, the Women Political Leaders, as we venture into the topic of immunization and we launch this study on immunization by the WPL. It's the release day today. And I'll not take much time because this introduction, uh, this session is a high powered discussion with very serious women leaders who have um, broken the glass ceilings in their various countries in the various regions where they are. My name is Dr. Masi Korira. I'll be leading you through this um, this day and I will quickly introduce our opening uh, remarks, our panelist, and that is uh, by Her Excellency Marie-Louis Colero Preka, who is a former president of Malta from 2014 to 2019. She's the president of Eurochild, member of the WPL board, Girl to Child Patron Europe, and she will lead us in her introductory remarks. Um, her Excellency Marie Louise Colero Preka has served in politics for the last 45 years, has been a member of parliament for 16 years, and was the very first elected female general secretary of one of two main political parties in Malta. She will introduce um, this particular discussion, this particular day, and Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your warm welcome, Dr. Korir. Greetings to our distinguished panelists and also to the audience following this important discussion. As a board member of Women Political Leaders, I'm delighted to be introducing today's discussion on the Global Study Report on Immunization. I'm proud to say that this global study is one of the positive and very relevant initiatives of Women Political Leaders. As we all are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about enormous changes in our lives. The ramifications have been felt acutely across all aspects of society and will be felt for many years to come. Data shows that almost 190 million people have been infected and well over 4 million have lost their lives to COVID-19. Vaccines have been one of the most effective tools that humankind has developed to combat disease in the last 100 years. They have enabled children and adults to survive, flourish, and contribute to society, while also preventing diseases from spreading. Taking my own country, Malta, as an example, achieving 95% rate of scheduled childhood immunization is reflected in the low numbers of childhood diseases occurring in Malta. On the other hand, misinformation surrounding vaccines continue to disrupt crucial immunization programs worldwide. Undoubtedly, misinformation threatens to have a profound impact on the reinforcement and expansion of global health systems, both currently and beyond today's pandemic. This affects mostly vulnerable people, including women and children and the poor. We need to keep in mind that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Furthermore, equitable access to immunization should be a guiding principle if we want to ensure healthy lives and well-being for all. No one should be left behind irrespective of demographic, social, economic, or geographic status. The, the Global Vaccine Initiative, known as COVAX, is a worldwide initiative aimed at equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. We do not only, we, we do not only know firsthand, but also research studies confirm that to have widely immunized population Political leaders and governments must invest in delivery strategies that generate demand, allocate and distribute vaccines, and verify coverage. Effective success can only be achieved through global political will. We know that no one is safe until everyone is safe. It is on this premise that women political leaders conducted this global immunization study to understand and highlight the views 
of different political leaders and governments around the world towards the necessary vaccination programs. I am delighted to announce that, double, that women political leaders will be launching the report today. The results of this study will hopefully equip political leaders with insight and actions on how to protect immunization programs for the greater good of the global society. The study consists of a survey of 151 political leaders from 59 countries and a focus group of 10 political leaders representing nine countries. Among the findings, it was clear that political leaders in the study placed high importance on the need for vaccination programs to combat vaccine preventable diseases. These political leaders also stressed the importance of a coordinated methodology on how best to contribute to successful immunization programs. Today's panel discussion will discuss these important findings of the WPL Global Immunization Study. I will now hand over the discussion to Dr. Mercy Corrige. Dr. Corrige is an established medical journalist. Her experience as health and science editor for the Standard Group, former health and medical news anchor, and former liaison officer for the Kenyan government will help guide the discussion in a meaningful way. I will end my introduction by quoting Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who said, global solidarity means one billion doses delivered to low and middle income countries by the end of this year. Vaccines donated next year will come far too late for those dying today. I hand now over the floor to you, Dr. Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your kind introduction. Um, that is uh, Your High Excellency Marie Louise Colero Preca, who has given us a, a warm introduction to this uh, particular conversation. And as you've heard, I think it's very clear that um, High Excellency is deeply passionate and vociferous about improving the lives of the most vulnerable in society, something that she has done throughout her presidency and definitely now well beyond her presidency. She's a strong advocate and avid speaker on a number of social issues, including poverty, social inclusion, equality, equity, children's participation and children's rights, gender equality, women's rights, peace, justice. I can go on and on. And we've heard that, that from her kind introductions about how we are not safe until everyone is safe, emphasizing and reiterating on the importance of vaccines. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the kind introduction of this session. And as you've also mentioned, um, this COVID-19 pandemic has presented a unique opportunity to truly consider the role that vaccines can play in society and to implement policy that benefits not only the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, but policies that strengthen the entire routine immunization program across the life course. And we know that these immunization programs are quite many, there are many vaccines um, across the life course of every human being. The majority of the politicians who participated in the study acknowledge the use the issue of disruption of routine vaccination programs due to the pandemic, but they're not necessarily fully aware of the impact this might cause. 94% of them, the participants in the study that is, are confident in vaccines, yet only 31% uh, have actively engaged in policy for creating and sustaining effective vaccination programs for vaccine preventable diseases over the last 12 months. This is a dismal number and we hope uh, our panelists will uh, address some of these issues that were raised um, or that were found in the study. The reason given by many for their lack of engagement is a general lack of trust in politicians by the public. Although many participants have felt little or no trust from the public, their role remains essential in protecting and promoting immunization programs. To this end, um, we have a series of five takeaways that have been highlighted by the WPL Global Study on Immunization Report. These include improving trust in public health by promoting the benefits of vaccination, Two is strengthening health systems that support national immunization programs. Three is developing 
an understanding of how vaccines can contribute to addressing health inequality and improving data systems. But today's conversation will focus on the fourth key takeaway, and that is the need to allocate short to medium term financing to the health sector for routine immunization programs across the life course. So this particular discussion is privileged to count on a, on a panel of health experts. I'll start by introducing my panelists for today. And first is Her Excellency Aminata Ture. Her Excellency Aminata Ture is a, is a president economic, social, and environmental council that was in 2019 to 2020, uh, president's special envoy for internal and external affairs 2015, 2019, former prime minister of Senegal and minister of justice, attorney general, and the WPL Global Ambassador for Vaccination. Uh, welcome. In Kenya, we say Karibu Sana, Your Excellency Aminata Ture. Thank you very much, Doctor. I'm uh, <clears throat> very glad to be part of this conversation that occurred in a very timely uh, uh, moment um, uh, from uh, where I'm living here in Senegal. We are in the middle of a third wave of corona never heard, never seen before. Um, today, uh, from the sample collected, uh, we do have 25% um, of positiveness of the tests, which is unheard of. Um, and yet we are also living through a so uh, shortage of vaccination. So this report is very, very important for uh, this part of the world, Africa, um, you know, the situation in Senegal is quite the same all over the continent. Um, so I think this report should be chaired widely. Um, we, would, we should base our advocacy effort on it because it's evidence-based. Um, what we are witnessing um, these days is um, a world that is going to be further divided uh, by COVID access or non-access to vaccines. Um, as you are following the news, some countries are um, sort of taking decision uh, of a COVID passport. That's how I call it. They call it sanit sanit sanitary passport, but it's, it's about COVID because nobody would ask whether you got vaccination from any other diseases, but it's only about COVID. So my fear is that the combination of factor uh, being non-access um, to vaccine uh, from southern countries mostly might close uh, further the access to other part of the world. Um, and, and this is going to take us to another levels um, when it comes to um, a globalization and, and, and universal access. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think that if we don't do and take the right measures, uh, many countries are going to get further isolated, which mean uh, further deterioration of the economic situation and further instability. Um, yet we do know that access to vaccine is a human right, as um, the, 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 the uh, general director of WHO is pressing it. Um, so this is very, very important that we all uh, take up, um, you know, to another level, our advocacy uh, efforts. Um, oh. uh, time, time is the essence. We, can, we cannot uh, under, underscore that. Um, and to, to, to finish, I think that what we also re need to uh, to, to look into uh, is, you know, the pledges. People pledge, countries pledges, but we are not seeing it. So we have to hold accountable those who hold, um, who, who took uh, promises and we have to see the money. It's now a money game, uh, a very important one because, uh, you know, many, so many life depends on it. And again, nobody's safe until everybody is safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your opening remarks. Um, our second panelist is Anupama Tantri. She's the Executive Director, Global Vaccines, Public Policy Development at MARC, which this particular role oversees the research and development of global policy strategies to advance access to vaccines, sustainability of immunization efforts, and healthy vaccine markets. Anupama has over 15 years of experience overseeing and implementing global and domestic health programs and strategies. Welcome very much, Anupama. Then last but not least is Hatish Kuchuk. 
I had to practice that name for like 24 hours. I hope I got it right. She's the executive director of the G20 Health Development Partnership uh, run by Sovereign Sustainability and Development. Um, since five years, she has led the policy, advocacy, and communications work of over 25 leading global health organizations in their approach and support to G20 member states and other international fora on the global health agenda. And as you've heard, um, we are in good hands. So welcome, Hatish. Welcome, Aminata, Her Excellency, and Anupama uh, Tantri. So I'll just drive in right to our first question. And um, immunization has delivered public health benefits for many decades. And I think some of us um, beneficiaries of that, that's the reason why we're here. And as our excellency Marie Louise said earlier, uh, it helps women and children to prosper. And we've been reminded over the last 18 months why it is critical. Uh, I'd like to hear from the panelists uh, what you think, and you share this with your audience, uh, is the most important reason for continuing to invest in, in immunization systems, not just for our health today, but for the future. I'll start with you, Anupama. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Career, and, and again, thank you to women political leaders for organizing this discussion um, and, and for really promoting both political leadership on um, promoting health prevention and immunizations, as well as promoting multi-sectoral dialogue. To answer your question, I think that the role of vaccination in protecting health, the economy and society has really never been more apparent and visible and clear as it is in this moment. However, at the same time, we are seeing countries struggle to roll out COVID-19 vaccines and to recover routine immunization rates that have dropped dramatically because of this pandemic. To me, that is a clear signal that immunization programs and systems have long been undervalued and underfunded. We're asking a lot of our immunization programs and our frontline vaccinators without necessarily providing the resources, the capabilities and capacity to do what's being asked. For example, I think we mentioned that vaccination rates have dropped recently. And just to put some numbers behind it, since the pandemic, 68 countries have suspended or delayed immunization programs. That's, and that has impacted almost 80 million children under the age of one. Measles cases were already at an all time high even before the pandemic and further disruptions during this pandemic means that more countries are at risk for outbreaks and, and, uh, and the potential for further strain on an already overburdened healthcare system. There's been an increase in polio cases in polio endemic countries, and we don't even fully understand the impact of the pandemic on adolescent and adult vaccination. We know that more than 800 million students weren't able to go to school last year, and we believe that that means that a lot of adolescents who normally receive vaccination in schools may have missed those vaccination opportunities as well. And even with COVID-19, we're seeing from a recent assessment that was done by the WHO and UNICEF and Gavi and the World Bank on readiness of countries to roll out COVID-19, less than two thirds of countries that were surveyed, it was a survey of about 140 countries, um, had plans in place to train the number of vaccinators that are needed to roll out uh, mass vaccination of COVID-19. And less than half had plans to um, implement um, strategies to improve trust, confidence, and demand in COVID-19 vaccines, which we know is going to be really important for high uptake. So really it's about ensuring that vaccination delivers on its full potential, both to end this pandemic and to protect communities from other vaccine preventable diseases that is the fundamental reason for why we need to invest. There's so much data to show that it is one of, vaccination is one of the most cost-effective public health interventions and that it provides both societal and economic returns that go beyond the individual. Um, with the exception of safe water, no other intervention has had that impact on mortality and on population health and immunizations. And as the report points out, vaccination is linked to many other government priorities. It can help to improve school readiness and performance. It can help to address uh, antimicrobial resistance by preventing infections and misuse or use of antibiotics. 
And we know that it's a smart investment. Um, lots of data show that the return on investment is very high. One study shows that for every dollar spent in low and middle income countries, it's a $44 return on investment. So there's a lot of reasons to invest, but I think the stark con context in which we are in today in the state of our programs is really the fundamental reason. Over to you. Thank you. Anupama, we'll go to Hatish on the same question. I'd like to hear uh, your views on why uh, we should continue to invest in immunization. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. And um, from me as well, congratulations on this impressive report. It's very timely and I can't agree more with Her Excellency Aminata Ture. This report should definitely be spread across G20 governments and more to realize the um, evidence-based uh, feedback that you received from public and political leaders, because this is exactly what has been missing over the past few months. Over to um, Anu Pama's comments. Um, the first uh, and foremost crucial uh, point in my view is the economic aspect. So when you look at the implications that the COVID-19 pandemic had, looking at the March statistics, $10 trillion have already been spent globally on preventing and managing uh, this, this, uh, this uh, crisis. And by 2025, another 22 trillion are expected to be spent. And this is a massive hurdle on global economies and societies. So with that aspect, it speaks for itself, I think that we need to invest in sustainable immunization strategies for the future. Having, I mean, look, uh, looked at that this crisis ha is exceeded or has exceeded even the financial crisis in 28, I think it's timely for our policymakers to realize that if we don't invest now, we might miss the boat again for the next pandemic to come, which might be caused through non-communicable diseases or through antimicrobial resistance emergencies. Um, another point, I think what we realized at this G20 partnership, and we are a partnership really speaking the voice of the private sector, product development partnerships, NGOs, and also policymakers is um, the, the need not to create further silos and to collaborate together in order to um, facilitate the equitable access of vaccines in future emergencies or for future immunization programs. Because as Dr. Ture said earlier, a lot of money has been pledged throughout COVID-19. The impact hasn't been seen in certain parts of the world, but more than that, um, the equitable access was missing. In fact, we had governments calling us up as the G20 partnership to convey the messages to G20 leaders that they cannot get hold of vaccines and they try to find other routes from developing countries to get faster access. The COVAX facility, I welcome it. It's an amazing initiative, but they couldn't do the job alone. And uh, a lot of governments from across the world have to join their forces, learn their lessons and promote global initiatives like COVAX in future to uh, promote equitable access. On two other points, I think uh, another um, massive uh, aspect is that um, manufacturing, local manufacturing, especially in developing countries in parts of Africa, Asia, have to be developed. Uh, lessons have to be learned in order to build or basically uh, level up the bioscience industry, the manufacturing industry in those countries. So when we have other pathogens with a pandemic potential, emerging for the future, uh, we can uh, respond to them regionally. And it's not just the rich world's response to, um, to another emerging pandemic. And as Dr. Tedros said as well, no uh, vaccinate, uh, vaccination will be uh, good if it's only for the rich world, because um, when you don't vaccinate the developing world, uh, you will have another emergence of another epidemic. So uh, with that in mind, my final point I wanted to make is also for future sustainable immunization strategies. One uh, other point that we have been missing in this debate is the potential of fake or substandard vaccines or medications that have been even in circulation. So when you uh, build um, local manufacturing capacities for the future and distribution lines, we need to make sure that we have an absolute strict policy or basically police structure that we avoid fake vaccines in circulation because this will obviously be detrimental for public trust and will be harder for politicians to make the case of why vaccines or immunization is uh, helpful. 
And I end on that note for this question. Thank you, thank you, Atish. And last but not least is uh, Her Excellency Aminata on why you think we need to continue investing in immunization systems. Well, I think um, uh, it was said uh, previously, um, this sentence should really uh, be the, our, our, our call for action. Nobody's uh, safe until everybody's safe. I mean, there's no point of vaccinating one part of the world and, and leaving aside the other one because science showed us that you may end up with uh, 194 variants, which is the number of the United Nations membership. So uh, we have to be smart. I mean, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's a matter of common sense. So what do we need to do if you want that to happen? We have the evidence and it was uh, clearly reinstated in uh, uh, WLP uh, report. I think it's, it's important to repeat the evidence and to, to hammer them to decision makers. Um, but now, as I said, um, if we have the evidence, what prevents us from acting and making immunization a universal access? I think it, we have to go deep down and see um, what are uh, the causes of not, that not happening. First of all, I think it's a money talk. It, it's, that I, I, it's very important that we stress out very clearly. Uh, until we put uh, our, our money where the mouse are, we won't have the result. And COVAX um, is a, a driving um, a framework uh, to, to, to put our effort in uh, because that's the, 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 the world instruments that we have uh, and it's pretty well organized. They have the expertise. So I would like, um, uh, I mean, us to call upon, I mean, that's what I do as an ambassador for immunization of uh, women political leaders um, to, to, to really uh, call on our leaders uh, to give the mean to the COVAX program. I think it's, it's very, very, very important that that happen. They should not be able to do it alone. We have to join our forces behind COVAX. Um, they're, they're showing the evidence. They're clearly showing the evidence. Mm -hmm. no, are you I, hearing I, me? Yes, I'm hearing you. I want to just uh, jump in quickly and ask before we lose the point on the money issue. Um, to ask you this second question, because I think they are closely related, that in the face of um, inevitable economic constraints following the pandemic, what do countries need to consider when thinking about budget planning for vaccination programs in upcoming budget cycles to support both national routine immunization programs and additional costs incurred by the pandemic? I think we have to reorganize our internal budget. That's what countries uh, have been doing. Uh, all over the, 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 the world, we need to have special lines, um, budget lines in the Ministry of Health related to immunization and a sub-line related to COVID vaccine. I think that's, that's a political decision that needs to be done. Um, so the public can also uh, hold accountable countries. So I think parliamentarian, and that's where politicians like us uh, are useful, we have to call for special budgetary line related to immunization and a subline very specifically uh, linked to, to COVID vaccine. I think that's, that, that's one. Uh, we have to cut on some of our expenditures um, that would look like uh, luxurious in the context of, uh, um, of COVID and in the context of the third wave. Um, I, I'm sitting here in Africa and I'm telling you that we are seeing it coming. I mean, you heard the number I told this morning I mean, it made all the head news in, in, in Senegal. Um, so we need the money for the vaccine. We need special lines for communication because um, we are dealing with young people uh, who feel like uh, they're invincible. Um, and we are seeing that uh, they've been hit hard uh, by, by the pandemic. So we need communication to be part of the program. It's not only vaccination, it's communication. Um, awareness raising, that's very, very, very important, including a group that are usually marginalized, rural women, very, very, very important to, to target them. Uh, young people, migrants. Uh, so we have to uh, sort of devise our policies, um, you know, to be targets oriented. That's very, very important. But because what we are seeing in countries, most educated, uh, those who have the means, uh, those who have the networks get vaccinated. Uh, no matter how short the vaccine stock is, those people would get their chairs. Um, but uh, the other ones, um, so it's also uh, to uh, link what we are doing to the human rights agenda. I think we should call upon our human rights uh, colleagues 
Uh, they've been advocating for years and years for the right to health. It's a good moment to take them on board uh, on this access to, uh, 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 to vaccine and immunization. And last point, we have to make sure that we don't you know, sort of abandon the other diseases because we don't want to lose the advantages of immunization that we had for decades, especially in Africa. So it brings me back to these budget lines of immunization that is very critical. Otherwise, we do know how we act as government. We just address urgent issues when we have the popular pressure. But afterward, you know, uh, you know, we will we will have to catch up because if you don't vaccine uh, newborns, young people about the traditional disease that we know, I mean, we will head to other type of pandemic in the continent. So that budget line for me is very very important. Last, last point on this question is how are we going to mobilize private sector? The money is there. This world has money, big time, uh, up to the point that they know they don't know where to invest it. If you want to have a loan now, you're going to have a 0% uh, interest, uh, just to show you how liquid the market is. Um, so we need to have some money that comes into the program. So it's uh, the, the time to really uh, scale up, escalate, aggravate, uh, social responsibility of corporation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I like your point on, you know, reorganizing the budget line. So I'd like to hear from uh, other panelists. Um, Anupama, what do you think um, can, countries should consider when planning um, for vaccine programs in the upcoming budget cycles? Then we'll come to Hatish on the same question. Great. Thank you. I think I think um, Her Excellency Amina Dutore said it really well. And so I can maybe just go a little bit deeper, I think, on some of the points that she raised. I think first on the point around the short-term investments and, you know, a lot of countries are using emergency supplemental funding right now to prepare for COVID-19 vaccine rollout. They're using that money to support the data systems, the cold chain infrastructure, the vaccinators, the communication strategies, so that they can prepare to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. However, at the same time, these are the same fundamental building blocks that we need for all immunization programs. And so I think the first step is really for countries to look at what short-term emergency supplemental funds are they putting into COVID-19 and how can they really maximize and optimize that money so that it has having a longer term impact and an overall impact on the full immunization program and system. And as Her Excellency said, we want to ensure both high rollout of uh, high vaccination coverage of COVID-19, but also not forget the other immunization programs. And so there's an opportunity to really leverage that investment so that you're strengthening the full system system and not creating parallel or siloed investments and infrastructure for COVID-19 that then falls apart once the emergency is over. I think the second point that she raised around reorganization of budgets and prioritization is really important so that we're also looking more sustainably Short-term funds will dry up. It's important that they're here now, they're necessary and, and more is necessary to address the response. But again, that won't be sufficient to sustain the evolution of immunization programs and for the broader system to continue to both maintain high coverage rates, but also to protect against the next pandemic. So it's really also looking at how do we create the compelling investment case now for more sustainable sources of funding that will last beyond on the pandemic and ensure that we can maintain that coverage rates, but also have the protection that we want from future diseases um, moving forward. I think it's really important for both of these points to be able to speak to the immunization program managers, to the people who are closest to the programs, to really understand what those needs are so that the investments can be made effectively and efficiently to really understand what their needs are. They're closest to what the programs need and what support they need. And so really looping them into the discussions around budget allocation and financing, I think is really an important piece and to bring different stakeholders to the table on that discussion. I think those are some of the points I wanted to elaborate in terms of um, that the, the points that Her Excellency raised. Thank you, Anupama Hatish. Yeah, this is all music to my ears because this is what we've been proposing since uh, two years now to policymakers to change and adjust their budgetary lines. What we said to them is um, now we have learned from a lot of pandemics. Let's not treat this pandemic and any future pandemic as a disaster relief. 
because all what happens is we're bringing together a pot of money. And I think in a few months time, when this pandemic is over, uh, climate change will come onto the world stage and we forget about this. And um, I don't know, five years after this, we have the same problem again. So let's look at this in a bigger picture is the key message. However, what we also proposed in the partnership is we say, if you can't measure it, you can't fix a problem. So the key thing of readjusting budgetary lines is what we found in our discussions with politicians and parliaments around the G20 is that you need to hold your governments into account. So when you look at defense budget spending annually, governments basically present their defense budgets. And even we're talking about budget planning for defense spending that we're even not using, right? It's always precautionary measures that we're taking. So why don't we do the same for, um, for our health or pandemic preparedness spending? There are so many great measurements out there today where you can see the impact of your investment to your country's socioeconomic growth uh, in how you measure basically your health investments. So the same as well for immunization. We can um, hold governments into account politicians can do that, to have an annual review in their parliaments to see how the pandemic preparedness um, systems are performing in their countries, how the impact of health investments are measured, what is the return on investment for, you know, better employment, better health, better economy or societies. And from that, um, that's a clear, I think, argument in itself, why there is a rationale for us to further spend sustainably into immunization programs in the future. Another aspect that we um, observed uh, quite crucially towards the end of last year is that, for example, when you spoke about the ACT Accelerator, which COVAX is part of, right? Many governments were dealing with the ACT Accelerator on a governmental level, not even the health ministries, it was just the prime minister of presidential offices. However, po politicians and parliaments didn't really know what the impact of the ACT Accelerator is. So money was being pledged, but politicians didn't know how they're helping to revive economies in their countries and in other countries. So we need to bridge that disconnect and there needs to be better communication as well between different ministries in the country and their parliaments, right? And for that, the measurements or the, uh, the measurements for the impact of health investments will be uh, a crucial tool. Uh, a last point from my side is uh, we need to involve health, but finance ministers and central bank governors into the discussions of budget planning for future pandemic preparedness, because we have all seen that if we, I mean, this pandemic has uh, put many people out of employment, out of schools, uh, and it had a massive impact on our progress socioeconomically. So surely it's in their interest, which is why we welcome now that the G20 will have a standing global health um, a meeting like the Financial Stability Board implemented from October onwards that will look at this um, basically um, the performance of national economies and their health investments. And this will be crucial uh, and will basically hold governments into account to force them to reorganize their budgetary planning and see the implications of health uh, into economic and social terms because it, health is, I mean, impacts all of us in our daily lives. And um, we have to realize that. A final point, Mercy, I'm conscious of the time, is also we have to learn from um, similar policies. So the green financing agenda, the whole climate change agenda, we have millions of uh, bonds that have been created to finance climate change or hold climate change um, um, problems. And why don't we learn or why don't, don't governments look at the success stories from the green financing agenda and how we can implement it to, uh, to the health space? And that speaks to Dr. Touré's point. So to have entrepreneurs and uh, basically businesses to hold them into account to collaborate better with governments for the future to create a further sustainable financing mechanisms and close the existing funding gaps that governments can't close alone. Mm -hmm. So still on you, um, Hatish, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how political leaders can improve public and government willingness to increase financial support for vaccination in order to strengthen systems such as healthcare resourcing and safety surveillance, which are all critical to trust in vaccination. 
Yeah, so the willingness, I think, clearly they can create it by showing these economic implications, and that will incentivize politicians as well as their government if they want to be re-elected, they better basically up their game to uh, invest sustainably in, into immunization programs or health system strengthening for the future. However, another aspect that we're looking at, Mercy, at the moment is we have realized that the trade unions, trade union representatives have been not that integrated into the process. Employers, especially in G20 countries, employees have been affected most in factories by this pandemic. And I think for a future discussion, and especially in G20 economies, or in some of them, trade unions have a big impact. We need to integrate the unions of uh, the voices of trade unions as well, because they will hold governments and politicians accountable as well to respond faster and more sustainably, because no factory owner or no employee wants to lose their jobs. And I think this is a uh, a tool how to create willingness amongst policymakers as well, amongst obviously many uh, other arguments. But I think this is a main thing that we have been seeing that's missing in uh, mm -hmm. in this uh, yeah uh, crisis to date. But I hand over to Dr. Terio Apama. Yes, oh, yes, we can bring in uh, High Excellency uh, Aminata on this uh, important question. How can political leaders improve public and government willingness to increase financial support for vaccination? Well, first of all, I think we have to, before even getting to that, keep raising awareness among political leaders. Uh, because as you know, we have a tendency to go wherever we believe uh, the public uh, mindset is not to get the, uh, you know, uh, we don't, nobody want to get the, uh, want to get the, 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 the people upset. But sometimes, uh, you know, we have to take uh, measures. I'm going to give you an example. We are in the middle of a third wave here. I'm not very sure any political leader want to come back to uh, restriction measures that we will necessarily need to take if we want to handle this pandemic. So we've been seeing um, uh, political leaders shifting from a position to another according to political interest. So I think we really need to um, have an advocacy point uh, where we need to support government that will have to take some uh, specific measures um, to, to end this pandemic. So I think th that let's not undermine that. Let's not assume that all political leaders do the right thing in the context. So let's keep bringing evidence. Let's keep uh, sharing good experiences. Uh, with them. Uh, what they can do, they're parliamentarian, first of all, so they should support the budgets that uh, show this budget line that we talk about. Um, they are very uh, much close to their political base. Um, myself, I was uh, in my base this weekend and I was telling, talking about COVID and how they need to go to uh, take the vaccine, although I got the response that <laughs> there's no vaccine. So <laughs> that was a little bit, uh, uh, you know, back to me. Uh, but I think we have a very, very, very important advocacy role toward the base, but we have to be the example we want people to be, to begin with. So I think that's, that, that's what we look up to uh, political leaders. They are, uh, they, they, but basically, they are, they are ministers, they take decision, or if they don't take decision, they can influence uh, their colleagues uh, who, are, who are now sitting, they are parliamentarians. So they have to do their advocacy work within national assemblies and, and parliament. They have to reach out to their base. And we do know they belong to political parties where you have youth movement, women movement. So I think they, they, they could be community workers, actually, very effective ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, um, on that point. Uh, and if, if I might just add on that point, sorry to disrupt, Apama. I think a key thing, Dr. Ture, is also that um, for political um, leaders to create links. So you have uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, yes, but if they don't invest now, they can't achieve the SDGs. And every politician knows more or less what the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are. And if we don't invest into immunization now, well, we have seen that people dying from COVID have been mostly people who had chronic diseases or cardiovascular diseases. So to create the relations uh, between diseases, with outlook to climate change, but also the UN's sustainable development goals, this is when you attract them more to make a change. Sorry to interrupt. You may, yes, you may you made a very a very good point, Atiche. But unfortunately, um, 
you know, we live uh, by the day as politician. You know, our, 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 our reference point is election. How are we going to continue to sit? Um, so we have to combine uh, long-term strategy, long-term, you know, argument, as you made, but with also a very immediate, short-term, uh, quick win argument, because that's how politicians live. We live uh, from an election to the other. Um, mm -hmm. And when we show, and I, that's why the COVID uh, activity uh, now and programs have to be very opportunistically taken by us uh, to support the global immunization agenda. We all live with our diabetes, high blood pressure, and all of that, and we know. Uh, but at the same time, we do know that if we don't address quickly this issue of COVID, especially in this emergency time, um, this is going to catch, catch up with us. Some of the politicians will lose their they, they seat because they're going to be considered as uh, incapable of, uh, of handling it. So I think let's combine both. That would be, that would be my point. And, and toward the G20, we can see it. It's, it's very important because in some places, government are held accountable more than in other places. So that's, that's also something I would like to, uh, to, to, to stress out. Um, I, I think, and it's it, and it's it, the situation also requested um, that uh, today, um, you know, we highly need the vaccines to to come where they need to be. Um, and one point was made very strongly, um, and I can, can give an example. Senegal is going to start producing its first vaccine only next year. Well, that's a good thing because we don't know how long COVID is going to last. But at the same time, this will increase the capacities that will be with Institute Pasteur which is a Senegalese organization now, despite the, the name. Um, and that's, that's what we would like to see in other parts of uh, you know, the Southern uh, world. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. I'd like to hear Anupama. About yeah, no, this is a great Palma. discussion. And so I want to just maybe pick up on three threads that I've heard both from uh, Hatice and from uh, uh, mm -hmm. Her Excellency Ture. I think one, just on the point of political lives are short-lived, I think what I would really encourage is that to seize the window and the momentum that's there today. So definitely has to be linked to the urgency that people are feeling, but to really ensure that that funding is secure. Um, and it comes back to, again, the mechanisms, the policies that surround that funding so that even when political careers shift and evolve and there's transition and turnover in administrations, that funding is stable. So I think that's a really important point that while the, the window and the dialogue is here and the, the opportunity may be short lived to get the attention and the political will for this, Let's make sure that the that the, the budgets are, are set up in such a way and the policies are in, set up in such a way that they um, secure that funding over the long term. I think to the point on how to harness that political will, I think Hatice made a wonderful point about trade unions and really what we're seeing is that this pandemic has put immunizations on all different sectors radar um, from businesses, employers, tourism sector, education sector. And so there really is an opportunity to harness that collective understanding, a collective appreciation and a collective voice. Um, and there's actually been quite a lot of work happening across the business community um, and across employers through a variety of initiatives, both through the World Economic Forum, a platform there of businesses and employers coming together to talk about how they can promote vaccination, as well as an initiative um, called Convince, which is a, coali a multi-sector coalition, including the International Business Council. And so really a lot of wonderful opportunities where different sectors are coming together. And I think to harness that both on the global stage, um, but also then the affiliates and the linkages there at a national stage, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. I think one more sector that is also important, I think is the development banks and you know, the World Bank, Inter-American Development, Asian Development Bank have all put immunization um, system strengthening um, on their top of the, you know, a, 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 as part of their financing mechanisms. And even for countries that may not need um, or want that funding, it's still an important signal, um, especially for ministers of finance, as Hatice noted, for those that are really looking at budgetary decisions, financial fiscal decisions, to see that these institutions are signaling that investment in this space is important, um, whether they are needing that funding or not, it's still a really important signal. So I think there's a wide variety of sectors, stakeholders that really can be brought to the table. I think one last point I want to raise, which kind of comes to the point when the report raised this issue of vaccine hesitancy. And I think we see in the report that 
among political leaders, the majority, um, and I think Dr. Career, you said this in the beginning, the majority of political leaders see the value and importance of immunizations and the need to invest. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the same holds true even for the public. There's a variety of global surveys that show that the public does largely support immunizations and investment in immunizations. And we're in an environment where there's a lot of questions being raised, there's an explosion um, of misinformation and disinformation. And so those questions are only natural. Mm -hmm. But for me, that should signal to our political leaders the need for more investment so that our systems can actually provide the right information through the right channels. Um, you know, Her Excellency mentioned the importance of communication strategies right now, and all of that takes investment. And so I think that environment to me isn't a signal to say, walk away from immunizations. It's one to say, let's invest more in immunization so that they can do what they need to do and really address people's concerns and questions in this environment and have the capabilities and capacity to do that. Over okay. to you. Um, initially, Anupama, you talked about um, vaccination offering a high return, investing in vaccination offering a high return on investment. Uh, could you share some examples of how decision makers have invested and allocated resources well to deliver value for money in immunization programs? Sure, there's lots of different examples of you know, what countries are doing, how they're funding and investing in this space. I think just again, really clear signals of value for money come from when countries set strong elimination targets, control targets, and they achieve those. And prior to this pandemic, many countries had been achieving measles elimination. Um, polio was very close to eradication and all of these things. So those I think are very clear signals when countries as well as um, global stakeholders come together to set targets um, and countries achieve those targets. I think one thing, though, for countries to consider is that sometimes it's there's there's definitely a need for more investment um, and more resources to support immunizations. But there's also a lot of opportunity to look at efficiencies in the system and how can you better link your investment to performance. And an area that I think is worth exploring is performance based financing. And there are many countries, um, the US, the UK, uh, Colombia, Argentina, Indonesia, that are either have performance-based financing mechanisms in place or are exploring them. And what it really does is link, better link national government funding to either local governments who are often responsible for delivering immunization programs and links funding to performance. So you get accountability of also how that funding is being used. Um, and a better way to show what that return on investment is. But it can also link funding to the actual vaccinators, the healthcare workers, to provide incentives for them to achieve high vaccination coverage rates. So it's a way to sort of make your money work harder and to really link it to value for money and to show that performance is being achieved and the outcomes are being achieved. So it's one example. I think just a second example I would note as well is that there's a lot of global stakeholders that are also looking at the evidence and trying to generate that so that governments can more easily understand what works, what smart spending, what kinds of interventions they need to, to make. Um, so there's a new alliance, for example, on advancing health online that's really looking at the role of social media and vaccine confidence. Part of its mandate is to invest in research to really understand what works. How do we leverage this tool better so that it doesn't create more disinformation or misinformation, but really does promote confidence and trust and provides people with the right information. So when global stakeholders come together to invest in that research, that is evidence for governments to understand, okay, what is going to be smart spending? What's the right interventions that I can draw from? And again, hopefully that makes it easier for them to show value for money that they're investing in evidence-based policies. Mm -hmm. Thank Over you. to Hatice and uh, Her Excellency. Yes, next, uh, Hatice, uh, have you any examples of um, how decision makers have invested and allocated resources? To yeah, so maybe uh, I'm the worst one to respond to this, but what I can say, because <laughs> we have Dr. Ture, who's the real life example here. Um, the best practices, I think um, we have Israel or some other countries who have been mentioned throughout the last few months, who have basically managed better immunization strategies. I think what's key is um, that the WHO, who created the independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response, 
that global entities like these have to uh, do a report in the next few months of which country performed well in their immunization strategy. And by bringing this together in a report, it will help other countries to learn the best practices or <laughs> lessons from other countries. And I think this is a um, definitely a strategy that um, these independent global um, bodies that have been created through the pandemic have to do uh, to help other countries. In, on performance-based financing um, and private sector allocation to achieve the ESG targets, I think some countries have definitely shown that they have collaborated better with the private sector and uh, for the private sector to give money uh, when they saw, you know, like better immunization strategy, better employment rates, a return on investment. So this, um, this obviously motivates uh, private sector entities to invest beyond green financing. Uh, but also pension funds are an investment method that uh, countries are looking into how they can tuck in money from pension funds to do sustainable investments such as these for the future. So I can just speak hypothetically of some examples, but a concrete one I hand over to you, Dr. Turi. Oh, Hi, Excellency. Turi, you can give us one or two examples as we now wind up um, the discussion. Can you tell me which kind of example because I have so many. <laughs> One that you think is the best uh, of how decision makers have invested and allocated resources. Just one that you think can be emulated and copied by others. Well, I mean, I come back to my budget line. You know, I mean, I think uh, um, having even a specific fund, uh, I think we should not be shy away from uh, looking at big. I need that the pandemic has such an impact on our daily life, on international traveling, on businesses, that it, 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 we, can, we, we should not shy from asking from an international fund for immunization and having national funds also uh, for immunization. I think uh, that's what we have to look up to. And I think it, it, it's feasible uh, bringing on board, um, you know, corporations, um, you know, multilateralism mechanism, etc. That's what COVAX is all about, actually. But I think it has to be bigger. Uh, and, 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 and so we, we, we can address the issues now and for the future. Um, I think um, we, I have seen here um, a, COVID, um, a COVID budget, specific budget in, in Senegal. And I thought that in many African countries that was dealing with uh, vaccine, but also social policies have to support a household. Uh, that uh, have been very hardly hit, um, the communication and, and sometimes even uh, food um, uh, distribution. So I think having this mechanism, uh, of course, a lot of people are going to say we have to mainstream it, but at the same time, maybe having very specific um, sort of program and fundings, uh, you know, specific to immunization uh, should be the way forward, considering, um, you know, the die impact impacts of, of COVID uh, and, and what we have lived through this past uh, 18 months. Okay. Um, Your Excellency, do you have any closing remarks? I'll give you like half a second because I see time is not really on our side. No, I would like to just congratulate uh, you know, uh, the women political leaders for this report. It's very important to bring evidence based to government. Um, and I, I also applaud um, you know, the, the relationship that we are building um, you know, with uh, a teacher's organization and others, I think we have to, to really uh, build networks that are strong to support each other. And let's make sure also that we have sort of a division of labor at the regional level, because some of our issues are specifics. Um, so I would like to link the region to the global. Uh, and I think that would be a, a good way to address the issue. So congratulations for this report. As ambassador, I will uh, carry it forward and, and, and make the points uh, you know, wherever we can do that, and uh, and hopefully we will be heard in good in good time in good time, not tomorrow, but now. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Excellency. Thank you, Excellency. Atisha, you just your very quick final remarks. Yes, very final remarks. Let's not forget, uh, immunization is a human right. So no matter of gender, race, or whatever, everyone should have equitable access for the future. Mm -hmm. I welcome the report and the evidence-based findings. And I highly encourage WPL as well to give your evidence to the G20 Health and Finance Ministers meeting in October because this is where impact will happen and we should really work with a joint force with these powerful women here uh, who are with us today um, 
to make our voices heard to really change uh, the future systems of health financing. Thank you. Thank you, Atish. And then last but not least, Anupama. No, thank you. And I think just to really underscore the same points that, you know, there's such a rich, wonderful opportunity right now for political <laughs> leadership to really take a stand and show that immunizations is a building block, a fundamental part of our health systems, our economies, of our societies. And the window is now for that leadership to have a lasting impact um, on health and society moving forward. And of the many, many barriers, the many competing priorities, the challenges that um, our leaders face, this one is doable. This one is an investment that can be made. It's an intervention that has been shown time again to have an impact. Um, and, and we know what to do. And we just need the support and the investments to make it happen. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the high powered panel for this um, interesting, you know, sharing of ideas on the w WPL global study on immunization. And I think uh, the key take homes is that there is a high return on investment when one invests in um, immunization. And um, this has been clearly and well articulated by the panelists um, that budget lines probably ought to be reorganized to avoid um, either parallel budgets or siloed budgets so that uh, it's very clear what is on immunization, just not for now when it's a, there's an emergency, but also for the future. Uh, the point about increasing awareness among political leaders, I think it's important because at the end of the day, as Her Excellency has said, they are our parliamentarians and they need to support uh, some of these budget lines and some of these things that would lay lasting foundations. So thank you very much. Uh, my panelists were uh, Her Excellency Aminata Ture, former Prime Minister of Senegal and the WPL Global Ambassador for Vaccination, Anupama Tantri, the Executive Director, Global Vaccines, Public Policy Development at MSD, and Hatish Kuchuk, who is the Executive Director, the G20 Health and Development Partnership. And this conversation was opened by Her Excellency Marie Louise Colero Preka, who had to leave us uh, shortly after the conversation, after her brief introductory remarks. For everyone who has joined us, you can access the report at the WPL uh, website. You can download it, read it, share it widely. We need to all be on the same page because this is just the pandemic we are facing now. We need to prepare for the future. I've been your moderator, Dr. Masi Korir, and thank you very much. Have a good day, a good evening, and a good night for those who are in the evening. So bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.